Hello again, everybody. This is Mr. Everything, and I am coming back at you with another Wargaming and Miniature video. This video is going to be the start to a new series called Oathmark Boot Camp, and it is going to be a tutorial video series uh, explaining the rules of Oathmark. The basic rules, the advanced rules out of the rule book. We're going to talk about armies, figures, how to do combat, how to do shooting, morale checks. Uh, also, there'll be a little bit in the army building section, as well as kingdom building. And uh, basically, we'll go over everything that's in the core rule book. And then, if all goes well, uh, we'll have uh, an advanced training for the supplemental books. So as I review each of the supplemental books, we'll go ahead and do like a, an advanced tutorial video for each of those books. So uh, subscribe, come back and check out all these videos, and let's get into this. All right, so now this video is video one. It's the start of the series. And uh, what I'm doing here is uh, I'm reviewing the rules as written. Uh, I do plan on doing about four or five videos explaining the Oathmark rules in detail. Uh, not only are we gonna read the rules, explain what the rules mean, in their context, but we're also going to go ahead and put a little of my thoughts, my thought process out there as well. Uh, and so it's more than just the tutorial. Each video will be supporting one or more chapters in the book to kind of help n navigate these rules and learn them as we go. Okay, so we're going to start off with the introduction or the basics. Uh, one thing about this set of rules is it gives an introduction to uh, what this game is about, which you would expect. It also has, just, just for your reference, it has a number of full-page art that uh, give you a feeling of, of this world. Uh, and also, it talks about what is wargaming. Uh, I... I lean on this because uh, not every player or not every wargamer or potential wargamer out in uh, YouTube land or on, you know, anywhere, uh, not everybody, or let me rephrase that, everybody has to start somewhere. So it's good that in these rules, they explain what a war game is. This rule book uh, talks about there being more to the hobby than playing the game. Uh, I've always told my community that gaming, or actually putting the figures on the table, rolling the dice, and using your measurement tool to, to move the figures, is really only about half of the game. The other half of the game is building and painting your miniatures and building your terrain and all that. Uh, and that's the other half of the game. So you got to kind of, uh, you know, understand that what you're getting into if you decide to be a war gamer, a miniature war gamer, that is. So what are you going to need to play the game? Well, there's the obvious things that you're going to need. You're definitely going to need miniatures that you're fighting with, right? You're going to need terrain to make your table look like a battlefield. Uh, you might even need, like I used a, I used a canvas mat. This is a painter's mat that I painted. Uh, you're going to need some way to measure your movement, either be it in centimeters or inches, uh, and, or sometimes in those long-range cannon shots, you're going to need a tape measure. Uh, you're also going to need dice, and in this game, you're going to need D10. Uh, 
This is a, 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 a die that goes from 1 to 10. In this case, you'll see a 0, but that represents 10. Uh, some of these other dice are percentile dice, and you might recognize these from your popular role-playing games. But uh, basically, you'll just need a number of 10-sided dice. Every figure in this game represents one soldier. There are games that you might play where uh, the, the figure represents 20 men or 25 men or, you know, so a unit of like 10 guys would represent 250 men. Well, in this game, every model is one person or monster uh, referred to as a figure. Most figures are grouped together with other figures into blocks called units, and these units will move and fight together. When you have multiple units, like a unit here and a unit there and a unit there, that is called your army. Uh, an army is normally 30 figures or more. Uh, that's really up to you and your opponent. But uh, when you buy a box of Oathmark miniatures, you already get 30 miniatures. So that, may, that makes the perfect start of an army. As you get more and more figures and more and more comfortable with the rules, you could build all the way up to maybe 300 models on the table. Each side is going to have their own armies and so that's usually you and your friend or you and your opponent have your own army and you bring uh, anywhere from 30 plus figures to the table uh, and the number of figures that you have on the table will be determined by points. A point value will be given to different figures so and based on their stats and their capabilities. But we're not going to get into that right now. We're going to continue on with what you need to play. Uh, Oathmark comes with an understanding that their models, individual models, are going to be based on a 25 millimeter by 25 millimeter square. Uh, that makes forming into units uh, into blocks like this more convenient when you've got a, uh, a standardized base size. Uh, can you play with different size bases? Yes, but if you want to stay with the Oathmark rules, if you ever plan to go play at a club or with other people, ensure that you've got your figures mounted on the 25 millimeter squares. Now there are monsters and larger creatures that might be mounted, or in cavalry, that are going to be mounted on different size bases, and we'll get into that when we get to those. Something you might want when you're designing your armies is to have what's called movement trays. A movement tray is a base uh, usually made exactly the same size or maybe just slightly larger than your unit and then when you put your unit in to this movement tray uh, usually the movement tray will have a lip to keep all the models inside the tray i'm just using this as an example then when you're moving this unit on the tabletop you don't have to move each individual model you can move them as a single maneuver element now, after the figures or the miniatures is the most crucial element, you need a table. <laughs> uh, that's why it's called tabletop wargaming. Now, you don't have to have a specific size table. You don't have to be a, a millionaire and have like a 12 by 16 table or anything like that. All you need, uh, especially if you're only playing with 30 figures, all you need is like a two foot by four foot table, right? And that's pretty much what I've got set up here. I've got a two foot section widthwise and a four foot section lengthwise. Now a larger game, like if you have a hundred figures on the table, you might consider playing on a four by six 
for most players, uh, what it comes down to is what you and your friends have. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly uh, acceptable. Not only is it acceptable, but it's encouraged that you use what you have. Now, most wargamers like to cover their table with some kind of cloth, like what I've done. I've covered my table with a cloth. Underneath this table winds up being something simple. It's, it's a ping pong table. Also, you don't want tables that are too large because what that winds up happening is the majority of your game time is maneuvering your troops around or trying to outwit your opponent when it comes to moving. Plus, it takes time to move your troops from one side of the table to the other. So smaller tables means that units will get engaged a lot faster and your games will be shorter time-wise. Now there's a lot of companies out there that will make these tablecloths for you. Uh, you could just order one and throw it on your dinner table and play. Uh, but I find it's fun to make my own. Or if you're failing any of that, just get a green sheet, put it on your table that helps as grass or if you've got a white sheet you could say it's snow you know or brown could say it's desert or whatever one reason why I use a cloth and also as it talked about in the rules is because you and your opponent have to measure movement distances and measure ranges for weapons and stuff like that you don't want your figures sliding around on a well waxed glass top or something like that where it's like a slick top like a dinner table or something that's why a lot of people will throw a cloth on there and that's why a cloth is recommended it's to keep them from sliding around now while it's acceptable to play on an empty table it's recommended that you have some kind of terrain like trees or buildings or bridges or roads or whatever uh, not only does it make it interesting to look at, but you can come up with some tactical reasons like you need to take the bridge or you have to hold those woods until relieved or uh, there's a little old lady in the farm that's burning down. You need to get in there and help her out or whatever the situation is. So you can have hills, rivers, villages, ruins, standing stones, oath marks left by long forgotten warlords basically you can just you let your imagination run wild there is uh, hundreds of videos even on my channel on how to build terrain uh, you can buy terrain and construct it like uh, model kits of buildings or uh, bridges or what have you or if you're more uh, ingenious or you're more uh, into the the model building part of the hobby you might decide hey I'm gonna I'm gonna build this rocky crag outcropping because it'll look cool and use styrofoam and paint it and put grass on it and rocks everywhere uh, there's a lot of tutorials out there I recommend hitting them up now you can grab a couple of just standard rocks maybe from your garden or something like that uh, or sometimes even your aquarium rocks are big rocks now when I say a big rock imagine a one inch rock to you that's a tiny little pebble but to a figure that's as big as he is so he would that would be considered a boulder now dice right I've, I've got a I've got a tray of dice right here I'm not going to use this tray but Dice, uh, there is a love-hate relationship between dice. I've got a group of skeletons. He's got a group of warriors. We fight it out. What are we going to do? Rochambeau to see who wins? No. The skeletons have fighting abilities. The warriors have fighting abilities. When you compare them, you have dice that help you determine the very randomness of the battle. Okay, so Oathmark uses 10-sided dice exclusively through the set of rules. Uh, you can get 10-sided dice from any hobby store. You know, you could get these on eBay. You can get 10-sided dice on Amazon. You can go to your local hobby store down the road. You can even order 10-sided dice from me. Now, they say... Ideally, which this is not the case, but ideally you want to have five 
10-sided dice per player, uh, and four of them of one color, and one of them of a different color. A different colored die is called the champion die, and we'll get into that when we get there. Right, so now you need a measuring device. Uh, I use, I use like I said, like uh, you can get like metal or plastic rulers. You could get yardsticks. You can even make your own rulers uh, using wooden dowels. I do that with other games. Or you can use uh, a, a tape measure. Remember, you can measure distance at any time in the game. So if you need to know how far it is from this rock to that tree or this building to that pond, you can do that. If you need to know where the troops are and how far away from you they are, you're allowed to measure at any time. Oathmark uses imperial measurements. I know that's funny from an American to say that, but it they use inches. So... Uh, even though this has centimeters and this has centimeters uh, and the bases are 25 millimeters, you know, which technically you could use just one inch bases and you'd be perfectly fine. But one inch, uh, the inches side is what you're using for in ranges. Now in the rule book, in the back of the book is what's called a kingdom and arm, army sheet. You have a kingdom sheet here, which is uh, a bunch of circles. It has one, then two, then three, then four, then five sectors as you work your way out. Uh, we'll get into de developing a kingdom in, in a future video. Plus you have your army roster. So each unit that you create will have its own little page here. Now what I like to do is just copy one of these or scan one of these and then print it on like a three by five card and that way each unit will have its own three by five card but that's me personally all right well that was just to get your feet wet and just to kind of give you an idea of how this is going to transpire but what we're going to do is we're going to end the video here this is the first part which is the introduction and what you need for the game and then what we're going to do is go into actually playing the game in the next video and I hope to see you then.